I'm going to hang out probably, let's say, for another 13 minutes to answer questions that come into the chat. Uh, otherwise, I will see you all at the next one. So question, uh, can you explain the difference between haze, fog, and smoke? Absolutely, I can. So uh, fog, let me see if there's a good, I don't have a good picture handy. Let me stop my screen sharing here. So haze, excuse me, fog, think of it as like a really thick, dense cloud. So when I'm doing fog, I've got a really thick cloud of, of think of it, well, as a cloud. I don't know a better word to describe it. And it's also usually going to dissipate pretty quickly. So it's a fog machine shooting out a big burst of fog, big cloud, and then it's going to dissipate into the air and go away. Haze, on the other hand, is very, very, uh, it's less dense. It's loosely packed particles and it hangs in the air for a very long time. So I might use fog for a particular effect, like somebody coming in through a door and having a big fog coming in behind them, versus haze that's gonna be on throughout my entire show that's gonna allow me to see the beams of light in the air, see my texture in the air, see my color in the air. Um, Low-lying fog is the same thing. It's fog, it's gonna dissipate very quickly, versus haze that's gonna stick in the air. So you know, I've had people say, well, can we just turn the haze on for a second and then turn it off? And it doesn't really work that way because haze is designed to stick in the air for a long time versus fog that is gonna be designed to hang around for a long time. Uh, for a certain show, how do I choose my color palette? That's a really excellent question. So it uh, depends on the kind of show. Obviously, if I'm doing a, a big musical anymore, most of, the, most of the shows I'm doing, I'm using a whole lot of color changing technology. So in the, in the, in the plot creation phase, I'm not thinking a whole lot about what colors I'm using because I know that those colors can change. If I'm designing an, uh, a straight play or a, a, a simpler show or show with a smaller budget that it's going to use all incandescent sources or I'm going to have to gel, then I put a lot more thought into it. And if we go back to those functions of stage lighting that we talked about before, it's a lot of uh, thinking about what I need to do. Reinforcement is probably the, the key when I'm, when I'm choosing those colors. I'm thinking about what time of day is this going to be, what season am I in, what location am I in, all of those things kind of all combined together. And then I'm informing my gel choices from that. A lot of this comes from years of experience. So I know what Lee 201 is going to look like. I know what RO5 is going to look like. But if I didn't have that knowledge already in my head, I might spend time in a light lab or with a flashlight and some gel. It's obviously not going to be perfect because you're not using the same kind of lamps. But I'm going to, I'm going to shine light through a light. I'm going to shine that color through a light. And I'm going to look at my hand. I'm going to see what it does. I'm going to see how it mixes. And over the course of my career, I've learned, again, what all those things do. So I'm going to make those choices that way. Uh, and I would say for most of my work that's not color changing, I think that that, that reinforcement of the realism or whatever it is is what's driving most of those choices. Um, I might... You know, if, if it's a really angry series, you know, if there's a surrealism to it, I might go a little more saturated with some color in a play. Uh, but for the most part, again, if I go back to the example of like a Neil Simon comedy interior New York apartment, like they pretty much all are, I'm, I'm looking for reinforcement. I'm looking for light coming through windows. I'm looking for what that light would be doing bouncing off the walls. I'm looking at my scenic colors. I'm looking at all that stuff to help determine those things. So it's a long story short, it's a combination of reading the script, analyzing that script, and a lot of just experience and trial and error about what different colors do. It'd be really easy, you know, if you've got some swatch books at home to start playing with that right now. Yeah, throw it on a mag light. It's not going to be the same as a source four, but you're going to get the same idea. You're going to start understanding a little bit how those colors mix and what they're going to do on people. Save up, buy yourself a couple of source four minis and put them on, you know, little Lowe's dimmers in your house and, and, and play with that a little bit. You know, all those things are very possible. How do you decide if the uh, show calls for use of haze or not? Uh, really, again, it kind of goes back to that realism conversation. So uh, if it's a musical, chances are, if, if it's a big kind of like Broadway type musical, I'm going to probably use haze because there's going to be room to see the beams. There's going to be a, an element of surrealism to it no matter what the show is. If I was doing a musical that's a little more realistic, don't really know what that means because, well, I guess some people do break out into song and dance in the middle of the day, but most people don't. Um, then I might not. I, I think most of my musicals in the last few years have used Hayes, whereas the straight plays haven't. Uh, on a straight play thing, again, if I'm using, if I'm doing a Neil Simon interior or a New York apartment, I'm probably not going to use Hayes for that because it's not, it's not going to help me in any way. The, the, the idea is not to do these overarching, you know, changes of mood with the air. It's to portray what's happening on stage. It's to, to, uh, to, uh, to tell the story that's trying to be told with, with that script. Um, but I've also done plays like I did in my, my demo last week where I showed you some stuff from the birds. There was definitely haze in that because there was this whole other surrealistic world to it, or it's post-apocalyptic and we wanted to see beams. We wanted to see that kind of stuff. I also, like around the world in 80 days, I used it. 
I've also done, I've used fog as haze before in small black box spaces. So we'll do it really light and we'll try to fill the air, but allow it to dissipate quickly. All trial and error, all just kind of depending on the needs of the show. Uh, next question, have I encountered cultural color choices uh, that have impeded a design? Um, uh, color combinations would be appropriate to show in public setting. Um, not personally myself. Most of my work has been done, all my work has been done in the U.S. So I haven't had any, you know, anything where this color would be offensive or, or anything like that. Um, I think more to do, more of a consideration for me is, is different cultural connotations to color, I guess. And so, you know, in, in some color, in some countries, red means something different than in other countries. And so, sure, that's a, that's a consideration. But for, because most of my work is in the United States and we kind of, you know, and there's a somewhat universally accepted, you know, red is anger, red is, is passion, red is these kind of things. That's kind of what I stick to when I, when I, I, I use my own kind of unconscious bias, I guess, when I'm making those decisions. Now, what I will say that that question kind of made me start to think of, you know, using, using what colors, I'm out of focus a little bit what colors to use on actors of color. Uh, that's a very real consideration. So I've done, I've done, I did a production of uh, Raising the Sun uh, was a very long time ago now, but I had very different skin tones happening in that show. Of course, the, uh, most of the cast other than one person in, in Raising the Sun is they're all black. And so I had very, very different shades of black in that. And so I would put one, I would put that same, same light on two different people and it would look completely different. One of them, no matter what I did, I could not get them to pop out. And so it was, it was, a, it was a very interesting game then of, of, of adjusting gel colors a little bit, changing colors, changing brightness levels to try to balance those things out as much as possible. And then of course the white person would walk in and then they would be like a ghost because there would be, you know, so there, to me, there's not necessarily a, this is, you have to follow this rule. You have to follow that rule because again, like you can say, don't put this color light on black skin, but then sometimes you might need to. And black skin, I mean, all skin has a, has a really wide, range of color to it. And so it's going to be different depending on, depending on your given circumstances. So that's where color mixing comes in handy or where LEDs come in handy a lot. It's a little bit harder to make some of those adjustments when you're dealing with gel. Um, so, okay. Favorite Roscoe gel color. My favorite Roscoe gel color, probably 39 or 339, either one of those deep, deep, uh, magentas, the skeleton, the sangria, or the Broadway pink. Uh, my favorite gel color is Lee 71. That's not true. My favorite gel color is R132 because it's a frost that I can put in anything and make it look good. <laughs> so, um, to do, what is my go-to CTO source for arc source follow spots? Um, so I, I don't do a whole lot of follow support myself. Usually Abby, my associate, does a lot of that. And so I'd have to look and see what color she was, has been putting in there. Um, but it's, it's depend, it really depends on what the units we're using. So for the last handful of shows we've done, we actually haven't even really used gel on our follow spots. We've been using the Roby BMFL follow spots. And so we're actually doing CTO wheels in those and we're doing color mixing in those. So it's all coming from the console. Um, but, you know, it depends on the show. I hate to say that's kind of the answer to a lot of this stuff. Uh, another question here, have I ever worked with the color mix device? I don't have one. So if anybody, if Chad, if you're watching from Roscoe, and you want to send me one, I'd be happy to demo it live. I'd love to use it as a, as a light here for these streams. Um, but I have seen it in person. Uh, Chad took me out to dinner uh, during LDI this year and showed me one. I think they're really cool. I think that obviously the, the, the color is not perfect. Like you're not going to get exactly what you're looking at. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna be able to figure out what color is gonna be my, you know, Lee 201 in a source for a luster when I get in the theater. But what is value to me as a theatrical designer is it's something I could bring to a production meeting and I could put it on a person, I could put it on a thing as, as if I'm talking with a director about what color it is, I can do that. It's something that I can, I can do live in front of me and I can put it on a person, I can put it on a scenic model, I can see all of those things. Um, and then it's up to me and my team to figure out how to translate that into the actual, you know, fixture values. I think it's going to be pretty impossible for any device to emulate all LED, right? So on a white, on a white screen, it's going to, or if you put it on a psych, of course, it's going to look the same. But if I start mixing that with a luster versus the color source versus a Colorado versus a Chinese par, all those things are going to change. So 
there is a, a, a definite, like I, my, to me, the benefit of it is the collaborative part of it and it being able to actually have, be able to actually have a real conversation with something to show at a design meeting or at a, at a production meeting instead of just talking abstractly about things. So I would love to have one, Roscoe, if you're watching. <laughs> um, go to warm and cool front light color choices. For a rep plot, so that's different. So for, for a show, it's going to obviously depend on the show. For a rep plot, uh, I just did the, a couple years ago, I did redid the Strata Center plot and I did Lee 201 as a cool color. And I think I did RO, I don't remember, RO2 or RO3. Depends on what fixtures I have and, and how much how much distance I have and things like that. Um, I, Lee 201, is, you'll find in most of my plots. And that comes from a dance, that comes from the dance world. I used to do a lot of dance side light with Lee 201. I've kind of morphed that into being one of my go-to front light colors now. Sometimes I'll switch it out for 202, depending on the needs of the show. But 201 is basically, it's half color temperature blue. So it's a color correction filter that's making my light bluer. How am I using my gel book? Phone flashlight, special, uh, special phone flashlight. Uh, I don't... Again, like a lot of this for me is now uh, just experience and knowing what, what that gel is gonna do. I, I'll be honest with you, it's been a couple of years since I've really needed to sit and really look at figuring out gels from scratch. Because again, most of the work I've been doing lately has been LED, uh, uh, has been LED based. Um, so I do have some source for minis, you know, that I can throw in. I've got one under my desk. that's not plugged in right now. If I had a larger space, I would love to have them kind of rigged up my ceiling on the little dimmer pack so I can play around with those things and experiment with those things. Um, but a lot of the times I'm just kind of trusting my gut, you know, I'm picking up, uh, picking up the swatch book and I'm looking at colors over here. I've got, I've got like 30 swatch books on my shelf so I can lay out a whole bunch of colors on my, uh, on my, on my desk at once. But again, a lot of it, and this is a part, part of it's kind of a problem. I do tend to stick to a lot of the same colors that I use a lot because I'm familiar with them. So sometimes on shows, I, I force myself to kind of push myself out of that bubble a little bit. So if, if you find yourself in that trap, I would encourage you to do the same. You know, it's really easy to use. Like Jake asked that question, what's my go-to front light? Cool, Lee 201. But I haven't really re-examined that in a while. So I could be, I, you know, so continuously be learning, right? Okay, uh, I'm going to try to speed up these answers a little bit. How do I choose colors regarding costumes? So uh, it's great when a costume designer has renderings and everything for me in advance. A lot of the work that I'm doing, I'm not seeing that until I get into the room. So that's where having multiple choices in front of me comes into play. This is actually something I really should have included on the main uh, session. So if we did, let's say, uh, let's say we had a, a blue dress on stage, right? So when we hit that blue dress with white light, what's happening is that dress, the pigment in that dress is reflecting that blue back to us and not the red and the green. So if I were to hit that beautiful blue dress with a red special, it's not gonna be able to reflect any of that blue back to me because there's no blue to give it, no blue to reflect. And it's not gonna be able to reflect any of the red because the, the, that pigment is absorbing all of that red. So um, I might have this beautiful vision in my mind for this really cool red special, but then it's completely ruined the costume. So this goes back to, again, just thinking about that additive and subtractive mixing and how those color relationships work and knowing if I put this color on this object or on this costume, it's gonna do something uh, different depending on the color. So this is a piece of fabric from e that ETC uses for their demos. It used to be available at Joann's. It was called Everglades. And it's really cool because there's all kinds of color in it. And so if I was doing a live demo of this, I would have, uh, I would do, I do that whole color wheel demo that I did virtually. I'd actually do it where they could all touch this fabric. And so as you change those different values of this, you can, you can see different things pop out. The easy way to do that at home is to take your, take your Roscoe, take your Lee, take your GAM swatch book or your Apollo swatch book, put it in front of a flashlight in a dark room and shine it on a bowl of Skittles or a bowl of M&Ms or any kind of candy that is multicolored or even just around your room on the different objects. You're gonna start seeing how those different colors interact with the, the what, you, what, what, what you're shining it on, right? So I've never, I haven't done a show where I've actually gotten fabric swatches before, but I've always seen like digital pictures or something like that. And so I can kind of visualize it. But if I, you know, when I was in, when I was in school, of course, we had fabric swatches. We'd throw them in the light lab and throw the gel on them. And if and then I was teaching that, again, if I was teaching this in a college or at a high school or something like that, that's what we would do. We would do this whole 45 minutes would be several weeks worth of experimentation and learning about all that kind of color stuff. Okay. Oh, God, so many questions. Uh, I'll get to them all, I promise. Hmm. 
Here's a good question from Jake. If I was doing an older show like Singing in the Rain, would I change my color fixture choices to match the period of the story? That's interesting. Um, if it was, so I, I think the best answer to that is like, you're not watching a movie, right? You're still watching real life. So you want to you want to light it like it would be in real life, unless you're doing a very particular like a particular adaptation of it. Or the director has a very particular vision where they want it to feel like an old movie. Um, if I was doing, let's say, I just did Holiday Inn. This is a good example of that. So in Holiday Inn, towards the end, there's a bunch of scenes that take place. I don't even. It's 1920s, 1930s. I think Hollywood, and there it might be. I don't remember the year but they, they go to a soundstage and they're filming those things. So for those soundstage scenes, I 100% made it feel like they were, you know, because the idea is the audience was watching this movie, even though we were only watching it be filmed. So I made color choices. I kind of kept it to more, you know, not color, you know, not black and white, but a little bit more of a, you know, a monotone world, things like that. Um, I've done shows where light, you know, light fixtures are visible. And so in that case, I might go a little more period with it. You know, if I was doing, if I was doing a production of Hairspray where we were trying to stay very true to the 60s, I wouldn't have a bunch of visible LED fixtures like I did in the production we did last summer. I might, instead I might have some old, you know, 5K Fresnels. I might have some big mold, like, you know, studio lights or something like that and hide all my other stuff. Um, I think it really depends on the show you're working on and what the particular, what that director wants for that particular vision to tell that story. Uh, I've, a question, I've heard that green color works well on African-American skin. No, actually the, the, the rule of thumb is it's the opposite of that. But I've used green on, on, on black skin before. Again, like I as a designer and as an educator, I hate rules. I don't, I don't like rules. Use it if it works for the story. If, if you, as long as you're telling the story in an effective way and you're conveying what that story is trying to tell and what the director is trying to tell, then you're doing your job. You know, it's as simple as that. Uh, when working with LEDs, do I uh, do I know the, the color palette when I go in, or do I end up moving through the palettes as you work in design? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Um, I, I definitely, you know, when I'm working in musical theater, I do I listen to the music incessantly for months prior to the show. I know the songs like the back of my hand. I'm trying to figure out. I've got a musical cueing session that I do, and I'm trying to figure out how to translate that into a digital session. Haven't quite figured it out yet, but if I do, I'm, I'll present it here. Um, but most of my work is very musical based. So I'm very familiar with the music. And, and as I start to hear that music, I kind of, I, I kind of see that song in colors. So a fun road trip activity for my fiance and I is we'll be going down the road listening to a song and she'll ask me what colors I think the song is. And I'll, and I'll just, it's a very gut reaction. So this song is definitely blue and green. And this song is definitely magenta. Um, and that, where that comes from, I don't know. It's, it's a, again, it's kind of maybe an un unconscious bias happening. Um, but it's, I think it's a combination of listening to the style of the music, the lyrics, uh, the pace of the music, the, you know, the tempo of the music, all those kinds of things. So yeah, I do have those things kind of figured out in advance. And then it's kind of a game of figuring out how, how do I take, how do I take those, those really saturated color ideas and still make people visible on stage. Uh, and that again is just trial and error and, and kind of just practice and practice and practice and knowing how to do that. This is where, you know, if you're going to examine one of my plots, you see I don't have a whole lot of front light. Most of it is side light. That's one of the reasons why, because I, you know, a front light is probably when I'm composing a cue, I'm usually starting in the background. Think of it kind of like a painting, right? If you're painting a painting, usually the first thing you're doing is you're painting the sky, you're painting the background, and you're layering kind of downstage or towards you from there. So I very regularly do that when I'm composing a cue as well. I'll start with my psych, I'll start with my background, then I'll start working my way downstage until finally, if I have to put front light on, I will put front light on. If I can get that light from any other angle, I'm going to get it from any other angle. So. Go to diffusion. Um, I don't use a whole lot of diffusions necessarily unless I'm dealing with strip lights. I don't do a lot of like studio work and, and really close work and stuff like that where I need like really soft pools of light. I use mostly frosts and silks. So I use my, my go to frosts are R119 and R132. R119, I will use usually if it's like a front light or, or a, a wash system of some kind, like a front wash or a side wash or something like that. 132 I will use in an LED to kind of homogenize the beam a little bit more. And I'll also, I use 132 a lot in my Gobo systems. So uh, I'll give a good example of that. I designed, again, that rep plot for the Stratus Center. There were, I think, 40 overhead templates. 
Could you imagine the amount of time it would take during a changeover to go change the edge of all 40 of those lights in a, in a rep type situation? So what we did is in the rep, they're all focused sharp and then they have a 132 frame you can put in or put out and that's how you change. If the designer who's coming in wants them to be sharp, it's one zip down each electric, pull out all of the frost and you're good to go. If they want them to be fuzzy, throw in those 132s and you're good to go. So I, I use 132 a lot for my Gobo systems and LEDs and stuff like that. And then silk-wise, it really depends on, on the, the thing. I'll use that a lot in footlights or in, in Sykes. Depends on, again, what the show is and what, what my needs are there. How do I choose color with LEDs? Do I start with a saturated color idea and make it more pastel? Or do I start with the LED interpretation of a gel? So uh, the, the team and I have a set of color palettes that we have built into our EOS show file for several different kinds of fixtures that we use regularly. And that's usually the lusters, the color sources, all of our moving lights that we use all the time, um, some Colorado stuff. Those are all built into those color palettes already. And so we, I usually will start, like if I'm working with a programmer and I say I want this, I'll say, let's put that in lead or let's put it in R80. And then they'll type that into the console or put that into the R80 color palette. And then we'll make adjustments for there, from there. So I use those gel numbers as kind of a jumping off point to have a common language. And then we adjust from there. And again, because we use, um, just because we use the same fixtures all the time, we take those libraries and as we update them from show to show, we, uh, we, we, we keep them with us. Um, but then from there, you know, it's, again, I try to get, it depends on what the show needs. So I, I, I love saturated color, but if the moment is not right for saturated color, then I still try to figure out how I can keep that same color story happening without, uh, without going fully saturated with it. When it comes to lighting plays, what are my thoughts and ideas? Um, again, I mean, it, it depends on, it depends on the show. I mean, I, most plays for me, the plays that I work on at least, realism is the key for a lot of them. I don't do a whole lot of surrealistic stuff. That being said, I just did Around the World in 80 Days, and that, of course, has a lot of music in it. It's not very realistic, and it's kind of a bridge between, we're creating these little individual realistic worlds, but they're being bridged together with all of these surrealistic moments. Um, so I think, again, pay attention to the needs of the story, read the script, talk to the director, uh, figure out what story you as a, as a collaborator, as, as a collaborative group are trying to tell, and then it's your job as that designer to figure out how to tell that. And there's not a one-size-fits-all answer to that, but hopefully, you know, using those things we've been talking about, the, the color, the texture, go, you know, all those things, that's how you accomplish those things. So. Um, odd question, but I'm doing Mary Poppins specifically. How would you suggest making stars or nighttime mood while still providing front light with limited channels? So that's a good question. But, you know, in theater, when you start thinking about nighttime lighting, where does everybody's mind go right away? You think, oh, it's blue light. I'm going to put R80 on stage and it's blue. It's nighttime. But, like, start to think about that for a second. Like, all of everybody go out outside of their house tonight in the middle of the night. Where is, you're not, you don't have primary blue light coming from anywhere right? So it's shades of gray. You might have a little bit of coolness to it, but most of the time it's certainly not primary blue. So we kind of, you know, we, we accept in the theater that blue means nighttime. Um, I try to stay away from that as much as I can. I use more, you know, paler, paler gray, I guess, to uh, <laughs> undergraduate blue. I like that. I think that's a good way to put it. Um, kind of like, you know, like less saturated blues, because then when you start dimming them down, they're going to turn that a little bit more gray. It's going to feel more like moonlight. I'm going to use, rely a little bit more on my distribution. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to change where that angle is coming from to convey that moonlight a little bit more. So I would, um, you know, I, I would first look at the angle you have that light coming from and then really pay attention to the color temperature of it. So again, we go back to that earlier example of warm versus cool. The cooler you can make it, but less saturated, the more it's going to feel like that nighttime. Um, as far as stars go now, it's, it's really hard to make stars without a physical like star drop or LED drop or something like that to create those stars on. Sure, you can put a, a gobo in with a bunch of little pinholes in it, but it's still going to look like little dots of light in the air, right? If you, especially if you put that, that little custom gobo in front of a, a Source 4 Lico with a warm color temperature, you're going to want to gel it too to kind of cool those off a little bit, make them feel a little bit whiter, because you're never going to put them at full. You're going to dim them down to 20%. And then all of a sudden you get, um, you know, you get the amber shift that happens with that. So 
try to get a star drop. Try to get, I, when, I, when I did Mary Poppins, we had a star drop in the back. That's so what we created our stars with. And then it was a whole lot of side light, a whole lot of cool side light. I wish I had access to photos quickly that I wouldn't have to find, but I did a production of The Tempest a while back and you know, we had a big moon. And for all of that, all of those moonlit scenes, we had all the light was basically coming from one direction. It was a very cool kind of grayish blue and it came from one direction and we knew it was night. Um, is there a way to, to take the amber drift away from halogen lamps? So you can't really take the, so let me back up. So if you're not familiar with what uh, amber shift or amber drift or red shift is, if you picture a halogen or a tungsten lamp, right, as we dim that, well, that light is at full, it's glowing white. It's very bright, it's white. But as you dim it down, because it's actually, you know, it's electricity flowing through a filament, it's becoming more red, it's becoming more amber. So R80, a primary blue at full, is gonna look very blue, but as soon as you pull it down to like 20%, it's gonna get a lot muddier because they're not putting equal parts red, green, blue at it anymore. I'm putting a whole lot more red and green and a whole lot less blue. This is something that's normally in my color demo, but it was it's really hard to show without lights in front of me, so that's why it's not in there. So you can't really take that away. What you can do is you, if you know that, okay, this light is, again, back to the star example, if I know that my stars are coming from a, a, a source four HPL lamp and I'm only gonna put them at 40%, then I might experiment with different gels that are gonna subtract the right wavelengths out to get me the color that I want. And of course, this is another big problem that we have when we're dealing with LED mixing, is with an LED, you can dim an LED down in R80 from 100 to zero, and it's gonna stay at that same color point and just get less intense. So you could have these two lights that when they're at full look almost identical, but as you dim them down, completely different color. Um, so obviously a lot of LEDs have modes that can emulate that and all of that. And there's not, there's not a right, like this is the way to go. This is not the way to go. It's just, it's a learning curve. Um, I, I was lucky that, you know, when I, when I, when my professional career was really starting to take off is right around the time that LEDs were becoming more and more prevalent. So I was able to really kind of come up with that technology where I feel a lot more comfortable with it, but there are still times like I'll, I'll want to put Lee 201 in a side light. And, you know, I just did, I did a show where I had that in the side light luster and it looked great. And then I'll do a show a week later and I'll throw the same Lee 201 in incandescent and I'll forget that it's not the same thing anymore. Um, and then the same question, yeah, I, I, there's not really a way to take amber drift away from a halogen lamp, right? It's going to happen. You can adjust it with gel as best you can, but it's going to drift because that's just the physics. That's the science of what's happening. Um, there's, there's not really a way around that unless you just leave it at full. And then you, you so actually that's, Okay, so there's a way around it. So let's say you had two lights that were two for into the same circuit and you needed one of them to be a little bit dimmer and you couldn't dim, dim them both, dim them independently because they're on a twofer. You can use neutral density gel to do that. You can re reduce the actual brightness of the fixture without changing the color point. So you can do that with gel, um, but it's a very specific uh, use case. I've had, I've had to do that in some strip lights before where like one cell burns a little brighter for some reason and we didn't have any extra lamps or, you know, all kinds of stuff. So there's places for that. Same thing, like you follow spot balancing and stuff like that. I'll throw a neutral density gel in front of it if, if one lamp is slightly brighter than the other just to even them out. But, uh, but yeah, there's not really a way to remove amber shift from a gel. Okay, so we went way beyond question time. I'm happy to answer any more if you've got them coming in. Uh, otherwise, I will hopefully see you all tomorrow night for Zoom beer. That's at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Grab a drink. We're going to have some discussion topics. I'll put a post a thing on my Instagram tomorrow asking for discussions. We're definitely going to be talking about Tiger King because Katie and I finished watching that yesterday, and I just need to talk about it. So we're going to be that's going to be our first discussion topic, and then we'll talk about lighting stuff too. Obviously, if we have time. Um, yeah, and so I hope to see you all tomorrow night. And if I don't see you tomorrow, see you Thursday for my design in a pinch session. Thanks, everybody.